Welcome, Joshua. We're so excited to have you here today. How are you? Hey, Sarah. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me today. It's our pleasure. Let's get started. Welcome to the Huberman Lab podcast, where we discuss science and science-based tools for everyday life. Uh, I'm Sarah Guo, and I'm a professor of neurobiology um, and ophthalmology Sarah, at the School of Medicine. I think you're... Wait, Sarah, I'm so confused. What's going on here? Is this thing on? Today, we're here to discuss how AI can benefit your health and what medicinal properties the technology holds. Sarah, I'm so lost. Isn't this the No Priors podcast where you interview technology superstars like Gary Tan and Alexander Wang? No, that's only for humans. We're really excited to have you. Welcome, Joshua. Yeah, excited to be here. Thank you for having me. So let's start with a little bit of backstory. You started this company, Heja, and it's had this amazing growth trajectory and is being used by millions of people now. Um, what's the story of starting the company? Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua, I'm co-founder and CEO of HeyGen. We found the company roughly three and a half years ago. And before that, I was working at Snapchat for about six and a half years there. I started robotics at Carnegie Mellon and joined Snap back in 2014 there. I initially worked on machine learning in Snapchat ads, ads ranking and recommendation. Then I spent my last two years at Snap working on AI cameras. So, you know, Snap leveraged a lot of AI technology to enhance the camera experience. If you look at, you know, 2018, Snapchat released the baby filter and Disney style filter. That was the first time I saw a computer can actually create and generate something that does not exist in the world. I was just so fascinated by the technology back then, and I had a feeling that that would potentially change the way how people create the content. So, you know, Snapchat is a camera company, and everybody created the content through the mobile camera. But we wanted to replace the camera because we think AI can create the content, and AI could become the new camera. And that's how we get started with HeyGen and our mission is to making visual storytelling accessible to all. I love it. The greatest minds of our generation, you know, inspired by, uh, you know, your face is a cute kitten or, or whatever. Um, uh, what does replacing the camera mean to you? Like, why do we need to do that? I use my camera a lot. I kind of grew up my career in the whole, you know, mobile uh, camera space where we work on a lot of the software and technology to enable people to feel comfortable and make it easier for people to create content through the mobile camera. But, you know, there's still lots of people are not able to create good content using the camera today. And we felt that if we can replace the camera, that means we can remove the barrier for visual storytelling, for visual content creation. And that will help us to step ahead in terms of the whole content creation space. What are some of the areas that you think, um, you know, the technology that you developed is applied to? Because I think you've started with uh, different forms of like virtual avatars so that you can uh, take a video of yourself and then turn it into a um, into an avatar that you can then feed text to. It can speak in your voice. It can do all sorts of really interesting things for different areas. How did you both decide to start with avatars? And then where do you think the main applications are? When we initially started the company, we tried to like dissemble the whole video production process. There's really about camera and then editing. So camera is more about a role, which represents a human spokesperson, the avatar piece. Editing is more about B-roll, adding you know, different assets, voiceover, music, transition, animation, stuff like that. So editing, we just learned from customer that editing is not that expensive because it's a pretty standard service, but camera is super expensive. And imagine, you know, it's a CEO of a company, he wants to we call something, we probably need to schedule that ahead of uh, you know two weeks of time. We need to bring in the camera crew, have a studio to actually record it. And even for two minutes of footage, sometimes we need to record it for 20 minutes because people need to remember the script. And that's the piece that blocking a lot of a business create their new content. So that's how we get started from, you know, trying to replace that piece of the process and make an avatar um, to replace the camera for the video production. Where do you think that goes in the future? So, you know, people are already using HeyGen for all sorts of different application areas in terms of, um, you know, marketing and sales and, and in some cases like internal webinars or learning or other things. I'm, I'm a little bit curious, like, is the eventual form of this, you know, everybody has somebody who steps in for them for their Zooms or um, is it used for entertainment purposes or how do you kind of view the evolution of this sort of technology over time? Yeah, I, I would say th there's many possibilities out there. 
I think what we are uh, tackling the problem so far, it is the you know entry point of the content creation where all the content started with the camera. And then we will have people doing a lot of editing after that. You know, we can clearly see a path where people can already assemble all this generative footage and apply the AI editing to assemble the final video. And again, you know, if we push forward into technology, making the perform performance much better, I think we will be able to create experience like generative video in a streaming way. And that actually will be potentially replace a lot of the, you know, real time conversation we have today, especially with the GBT 4.0 and with all this multimodal real time streaming technology altogether. Uh, okay, if we're still in asynchronous video creation land um, in 2024. How do people use HeyGen today? Like, what are the favorite use cases you have? I would categorize the use, uh, the use case of HeyGen into three, create, localized, and personalized. And, you know, people can sit, let, uh, um, you know, the cast from a, a library from our avatar or create their own digital twin and just like select a template or type the script and generate a video. This works the best for product screener, how-to videos, learning development, and some sales enablement training content. We can also take the existing video that localize that into 100, more than 175 different languages and dialects. And, you know, in this way, we can help customers to really localize their content into local languages. And last but not least, people can also use HeyGen to personalize the video messaging at scale. So I think there's uh, many, many very creative use cases on HeyGen today. We are a very horizontal platform. I would say one of my favorite um, use case is probably the recent launch with Madonna. And Madonna launched a sweet campaign where they can allow people to send a message to a family member in the different languages. I love him so much. I would run out of words to express my love for him. You know, I just want to call it out, you know, AI is for everyone, grandma and grandchildren alike. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, I mean, like that's a, a big brand in a public like consumer facing use case. Um, how do you think about like the quality of HeyGen today? It like, you know, I, I, I would have thought of that as like sort of, sort of tip of the pyramid in terms of quality. And, you know, how can you tell when the avatars are good enough and, and not? Yeah, so I, I would say um, um, quality has always been, you know, the number one priority of the product and business and technology, I would say. You know, um, I, always, I always have a framework like this. Uh, there's an invisible line of a quality, you know, let's say that threshold to 90. Uh, anything below 90 essentially is unusable for the customers because we cannot really replace the real life uh, production process they have. We really, really need to focus on making the video generation quality that go above that threshold. And I think especially for Avatar today, it is above that. So we can really helping people to replace the real camera and unleash a lot of the creativity process that help people to scale the content production there. And, you know, obviously, you know, there's a m much more room to improve, for example, generating the full body avatar, being able to bring all, most, all sorts of elements into a video. Yeah, we're in the process of, uh, of that. What, what are you most excited about in terms of like what's next or new releases you guys have coming? I, I think there's many things very exciting going on in our technology and product roadmap. I think particularly I'm very excited for the full body generation of the avatar. Historically, all the te avatar technology has been focused on the upper body. It's really hard to generate the gesture and the, emo the, the body motion. But a lot of academic research has proven that this is very possible now. And we just need to like basically take that into the last mile. And another thing I would say, um, something I'm very excited about the streaming avatar uh, especially with the uh, latest release on GPT 4.0, really, really help to improve the performance of the real-time interaction with text and voice. And HGN Avatar could become a visualization layer for all those applications. Obviously, you need like full gesture control and movement to get to any video of any kind. But mm -hmm. what do customers want to do in terms of full body motion today? Like you you had a, like a demo of walking um, in you know the last couple months. The, the way how we look at it is that there is a, a spectrum of the quality requirement 
um, laying out on different use cases, right? Let's start from the uh, the left side of the spectrum. Um, it's the learning development content, educational content. It's more like one-to-many broadcasting, um, talking about educational training content. The quality there is lower because the, the avatar can be more still, more professional. But if on the right side of the spectrum, we call that as like the high end, you know, marketing content, really dynamic, you know, the, the, the one example would be the ads creative and people ship very, very dynamic content on ads. Um, and because that can really help to improve the ROI of the content, making it more engaging. I think making the full body, enabling that full body rendering would be able to help us to bring the avatar, to bring the video into the next level of engaging and authentic. And that will help to unlock a lot of use cases in a broader case of marketing and sales. Newscasts or other things, uh, to your point, they often have the shot of the people walking and talking is like a standard can shot. And there's like these standard things that they use that if you had full body, you could provide for all sorts of application areas. Um, I, I guess uh, related to that, what is the technology that you folks are using today? You mentioned some things like GPT-40, but you've also built your own models in-house. Like how, how do you think about the technology stack that you're using? And how does that have to evolve in order to be able to do full body or other new things? There's a three model, right? Text, voice, and video. Um, so we work with uh, um, OpenAI, ChatGPT on the text generation side. Obviously, also serves uh, like the brain of the orchestration engine that we build internally. And we work with uh, you know uh, OpenAI and EvenLab on the voice engine, but we build the entire video stack in house including after creation, video rendering, and B-roll generation. So I think over time, I think the whole technology trend has been moving towards to a direction. A lot of all these things will be chained together. The multimodal model, multimedia, all get to into one single model. Um, one of the challenges I want to call out for the full body generation is actually, how do you actually connect that voice into together with the you know, gesture motion? And that's actually something will be unlocked by actually getting the voice model and the um, video model training together so that it can sort of like build a connection underlying the model as well. And that has been historically really, really hard because we have to like train the TTS model on one hand and then feed the TTS model outcome into a uh, video model. And that's, it's pretty hard to build that connection. But with multimodal model training, that's very possible. Obviously, Sora is not available to developers and end users today, but there are like world class text to video generation models that are generic, not avatars. How do, how does this technology differ from something like Sora? When we initially started HeyGen, we want to help the business solve the video creation problem. What does the business looking for? They're looking for quality. They're looking for control. They're looking for consistency, right? So. When we try to look back, okay, this is the North Star, how can we get there? What's the technical path to get us there? This is essentially probably potential two paths. One is the test to image, the SORA, where we try to generate the entire thing from end to end. And um, so you get the entire video at once. And the other approach is that what we believe in at HeyGen is that we try to disassemble the whole video into different components. Largely it will be A-roll and B-roll. Um, B will represent all different kinds of elements like voiceover, music, transition, A will being the avatar. And we try to tackle this component one by one and then we build the orchestration engine around that to assemble that final video together. We felt that this technical path is more capable to deliver the quality, you know, the control and the consistency that the brand is looking for. Because for example, there's some stuff we should probably should not try to generate. Is the logo and the fonts. That needs to be very accurate. And not to mention that we also need to be able to learn about, especially in the business context, we need to learn about the brand style, the color mapping, etc. from the customers. And I think the second approach would give us more flexibility and capability to build that system around it. And in fact, we actually see Sora as our partner because we, can, we are able to integrate that as one of the component you know, generator and then feed that into our acquisition engine for the business a application. How do you think about um, what research, you, you know, if you just focus on like components of the experience, in particular the video stack being the thing that you really want to own and be state of the art in at HeyGen, 
How do you approach, like, new capabilities from a research perspective? Is it, you know, look at what's available in academia, look at the problems customers give you, um, sort of de novo? I, I would say it's a combination. I, I would add one more thing is that we need to deeply understand the limitation around the model and try to find the uh, connection between what is the customer looking for, what's capable with the technology. Like when we really try to look at it, all the AI model had uh, some sort of a limitation. And I think the key question is that in order to deliver a great product experience for the customer, is that how do we design a product around it so that we can try to avoid the limitation of the model, but help to amplify the strength of the model. And that's just something that's really important to find the new area that unlock the new creation experience. But one example would be when we look at, you know, the video translation uh, technology. It's, uh, um, you know, it's a whole new way to translate your content compared to traditional dubbing. We preserve the user, uh, the natural voice and their facial expression. But if you look at really underlying the model, what enabled that video rendering, it is actually uh, a lip sync model, right? But we kind of like figure out a way to combine all this together, together with the voice, as well as the translation with ChatGPT and build a great experience around it. And sort of like we are creating a whole new experience for localized their video and content. So there's lots of like great McDonald's, like exciting commercial applications. Um, I think a lot of people also think deep fakes are really scary, like and the ability to, you know, abuse somebody's, um, you know, likeness or voice is scary. How do you think about um, safety, election safety, abuse? Like, first of all, we do not allow any political or um, election content on our platform today. HGN's policy strictly prohibit those creation of, you know, unauthorized content and we take abuse of the platform seriously. So we have our safety, you know, security safeguard include very advanced user verification, include, you know, live video consent, dynamic verbal passcode, and rapid human review in the back of all the other have being created on the platform. Trust and safety is critical to our uh, business, and we are actively partnering across the industry, you know, continue developing the tools and best practices to combat misinformation and AI safety. And we actually build the safety as part of the design. If you look at a lot of, um, you know, after creation process on HGN, and we pay all this safety concern and safety guard on every single step of the creation process as well. It makes a lot of sense. I guess um, it's kind of interesting because if you think about it, at least from the positive version of this, and you talked about how you try to protect against a negative, the positive version is, you know, you're running for office and you should be able to send a personalized message to each voter uh, literally into their inbox with a short video clip of you talking to them specifically or talking to issues that they specifically care about or things like that. And so you could imagine using this technology in the future for actually hyper-personalized political campaigning. Um, and as long as you can avoid some of the the deep fake side of it, um, then obviously it could actually be quite valuable. Um, how do you think this ability to really generate large scale, differentiated, personalized, et cetera, content of individuals talking, how does, how does this kind of generation change how people will make or use video in general? You know, if people can generate um, very engaging and authentic video content, they will basically um, create more videos and use video more for their business to grow their business. And we, we, we live in a, a video first role um, where every business wants to create more videos. I think the bottleneck today in the industry is that video is just not very expensive to make and it takes like weeks or months to make a video. I think it would fundamentally change a lot of way how people are thinking about how to grow the business how to do the communication, how to do the marketing and sales. So I do think there's a huge possibility that we can create and generate a, um, a very high degree of a, um, personalized um, video, especially with the full body avatar that being able to deliver um, a very dynamic and high quality content out there. So I want to give you one example is that I think a lot of AI generation is not only about, obviously, you know, cost saving and time saving is one aspect of the value prop. But it's actually, we are seeing a lot of customers using that to unlock new use cases. 
and being able to do something they were not able to do it before, I think that's the key job point of a lot of a business outcome today. How, how do you think about it in the context of real-time versus asynchronous? It feels like a lot of these technologies are focused right now in asynchronous use cases. And that's true as well of just pure text-to-speech models. When do you think we move to any sort of real-time or close to real-time video avatars and um, sort of the uses of that? I look at it in two ways. Like one is that the real-time application of the avatar, like even now it's possible. I think people can already experience that on HeyGen. We are making an, um, a new update that can make it even faster. So it can potentially become, let's say the virtual, um, you know, AI, uh, SDR, uh, virtual support that help to take customer calls or uh, provide support, right? And, you know, I think the technology has been always like developing like this chain. Um, two years from now, it would not be crazy to look at a lot of avatar generation, asynchronization pipeline will become real-time streaming capable. And I also see the world is moving towards a way that we can probably generate the entire video in real time as well in the future. In the future, let's say five years from now, I have a, a opinion like you know, generative image is still an image, but generative video is not a video; it is a new format. What I mean by that is, you know, when we really look at a video, we look at it as an MP4 file, right? So it is immutable. Like for example, if um, you and I are on Instagram, we probably get recommended by different. Um, to different, to different ads, but as long as we are recommended from the same business, we are looking at the same MP4 file. But it does not need to be the same. Let's say if maybe I like avocado, I should be watching an ad with Coca-Cola and avocado and showing the, uh, you know, the, the, the new story about Coca-Cola with me. And you like something else, you could be looking at something else. And this is not possible today because making videos is expensive. But this could be very possible. Let's say we can actually you know, real-time generating the video ads that you like according to you, your user attribute, that will potentially become a new format. You know, when we really look at today's video player, it corresponded to only one MP4 file. And it, it, it doesn't need, need to be true. Uh, it doesn't need to be like that. That video player can actually take in a lot of, uh, you know, user attribute and generate something in real time to match what's the best way to deliver that content to customers. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, um, uh, you know, one interesting analogy would just be like, if you think about, um, you know, YouTube as one of the largest learning devices in the world today, like uh, it is um, static, immutable video for everyone, but it's pretty clear, Bloom studies and, and um, everything else that like personalized education is going to be the path that is more effective. If people want to learn by video, but it's very hard, it's too expensive to make that video personalized. This feels like a you know opportunity for a very different educational future too. Yeah, and and one of the use cases we have seen from customers that you know Pubsys group they generate more than a hundred thousand videos, uh, a thank you video to send to all the employee globally, and in localized into different languages, personalized with a name and they are. Um, they, w what they like about, about the, you know, when they join the company and stuff like that. And historically, that is actually only delivered with one video, right? So they may be the CEO of the executive team, hop on into a camera and we call something, you know, saying thank you for the, um, you know, 2023. But now that message and communication can really personalize at a very, very big scale. So one thing you mentioned is uh, the various aspects of research that you're doing in terms of building your own video models as well as using third-party APIs. What's been difficult or hard from a research perspective? Unlike a lot of other uh, model, I think building video model, um, you know, being able to integrate aesthetics into the AI model is pretty hard. So, you know, video generation is not only about solving a mathematical problem, it's actually about creating something the customer love and appreciate. So essentially, a, a model with a, a lower optimized cost function doesn't mean it actually produces a better visual outcome. So I, I guess that is the piece that making it really hard to evaluate, but also really important to deliver the mile, the last mile of the value for the customer. And you know, generally, evaluation is also hard. We have to rely on in-product signal, for example, A-B test, to know which model is actually better uh, because you know, only the customer 
can be the judge for that. And this process generally is just not differentiable from a mathematical standpoint. We kind of have to form a system, build a system around it, and be able to feedback those data into our model training so that we can continue, continuously to improve. Did this approach come to you because of your work at Snapchat working on consumer products, or is it something that you had to come up with in the context of PageN itself? I would say it's very similar, especially on where, when we work on uh, the camera software. Uh, so how do we know whether this parameter was better or the other one was better? And I think we can definitely come up with some, you know, um, very objective matches about, hey, you know, uh, lightning score, this is lightning score, this is resolution. But there's so many things we figure out, hey, a better resolution, I mean, higher resolution doesn't mean it's a better image quality for customers. Uh, if you look at iPhone, it does not have the best resolution always compared to uh, a lot of other phones, but it does produce the image that most people like about using iPhone to capture the image. And yeah, there's a very similar lessons out there we learn from in early days of Snap. Yeah. What can you say about how big Heijian is today? We are a little bit over 40 people, but we are serving over 40,000 40, paying customers on the platform today. And I think what's so interesting about our customer is that these are not the typical AI early adopter, adopters. These are main street companies from European manufacturers to small business, to global nonprofits, to Fortune 500 companies, which is based the problem we are solving. Given that you have a thousand customers per employee, which is an incredibly impressive metric, are there specific key roles that you're hiring for or other things that maybe um, members of our audience may want to apply for? Sure, yeah. We, we're hiring across different teams, basically. Product, design, engineering, AI research, and go-to-market. Yeah. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Thanks, Joshua. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Find us on Twitter at No Priors Pod. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to see our faces. Follow the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. That way you get a new episode every week. And sign up for emails or find transcripts for every episode at no-priors.com.